Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Martin Luther King Day of Service and Social Justice Day. Um, normally we'd be in the meeting house together, uh, gathered in that warm space against what is often a dreary day. Um, but today we're joining each other from our homes um, and sharing our, our, those windows into our lives together. And I'm, I'm very glad that we're able to join on a very important day of commemoration, of motivation and inspiration. So let's start our time together with some shared moments of silence. So I've been thinking a lot the last few days about Martin. In progress. Martin. I'm sorry. I've been thinking the last few days a lot about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. as in his role as a prophet, um, because he surely comes from a prophetic um, tradition, sharing a prophetic vision with a prophetic voice. And I wanted to say a little bit about what that means um, in terms of understanding um, his power in the world to inspire and make change. Um, and a, and a prophet is, I think, distinguished by two, two things. One is a deep sense of burden and a, a set of powerful gifts. And the burden of a prophet is someone who can plainly see, not turn away from the suffering of the world. And MLK saw very clearly the suffering in the world of his day of racial oppression and segregation, unequal and weaponized systems of justice, the war in Vietnam, the scourge of widespread poverty in a wealthy nation. These are, are realities that he saw clearly, deeply and felt and could not turn away from. And he felt called by his God as a man of the cloth um, to stay with that suffering and speak, speak to it. The gifts that that accompany the burden of a prophet are the gifts of the spirit. MLK brought vision, uh, a way of seeing the world, a way of seeing the world as it could be in the language of the promised land, in the mountaintop, in the beloved community, because he believed that with the courage of the spirit, the inexhaustible love of the spirit, uh, the inspiration, um, the, the um, Console, consoling of the spirit, that we could take on the difficult things and transform the world. Um, and so when I think about our time, we live in a world of vast suffering as well. Um, we live in a time of uh, rising anti-Semitism, of anti-Asian violence, of unleashed racism in the public discourse, a still uh, systemic racism that still needs to be dismantled, that still oppresses, that still creates inequities, that still misuses systems of justice against our own people. We live in a time of political dehumanization of climate crises. So we still live in a world of suffering. What does it mean for us to look at the world through a prophetic lens and find our, our way in it? How do we find our place as individuals when the problems that we see are so large and so beyond us? And so I just want to share a quote that I have shared from time to time with the faculty and staff um, that was inspired by Oscar Romero, uh, another prophet in his time in El Salvador, who was martyred for truth telling uh, and for his prophetic voice as well. And this is a poem speaking about him, inspired by him. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view the kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. This is what we are about. We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. 
We provide yeast that produces effects beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for God's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Dr. King knew that he would not live to see the promised land. And he said so in his, in his final words. Um, and we will not live to see the completed promised land either. But we join the work of the spirit and the powerful work of alleviating suffering, of caring for those around us, of building beloved community. We can be encouraged by the love we see every day in our families, in our relationships, in communities that build up to do good things together. And so we join that good work in commemoration uh, and, in, and, be, and inspired by the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to think, turn things over. Andrea is our, is our leader today. I wanna thank her publicly for her, her leadership, her initiative, uh, her deep care for this day over many, many years. I know that she will thank others, but I wanna say thank you to her. Thank you, Rich. I am now um, really pleased and very blessed to introduce Sydney Brown, the Philadelphia 2021 Poet Laureate. Uh, if you have not had the true gift of hearing um, Sydney's poetry, um, you are very blessed to do so today. She is an incredible poet, an incredible voice of her generation, a voice of change, such a, a thoughtful, courageous, strong artist. And we are so fortunate um, to have her share with us today. So Sydney. Thank you. Uh, so I will be reading a poem I wrote entitled People's Holiday. This is not a black holiday. It's a people's holiday. People think it's just about me, just about my family tree, just about the color of my skin and the acts Martin Luther King Jr. did so my people could win. But that's not true. MLK cared about you and you, equality, unity, equity, inclusion, things my school stands for, but the whole world must be in delusion. So recognize this brave man died fighting for something bigger than himself. We often make ourselves numb to the violence surrounding us. We often turn the other cheek instead of helping our neighbors. We pick up our phones and record the monstrosities while victims are screaming, help me. MLK didn't do that. He witnessed people suffering, being treated unfairly, segregation, tearing apart a whole nation. He didn't just stand there and wait for change to happen. He marched, he brought change, he was a part of a movement and became the movement. MLK brought us a long way, but we still aren't one together. We must learn to live together as brother or we will perish together as fools. We treat our neighbors as our enemy if they don't share our complexion. We are blinded by our own problems that we fail to see our reflection, reflecting back all the pain we inflict onto others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not all of us are the same, that I know is true. Witness your neighbor's suffering, help each other rise up. If we just put each other down, it will be a harder climb up. If you thought your voice was powerless before, silence can only cause more destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. 
So this is our second year of celebrating the life and work of Dr. King. Um, and what I, what I said to someone earlier this week um, is that the pandemic does not stop us. Um, I want to say thank you to Bonita Huggins uh, for her work. She really functioned as a co-clerk. Uh, and Bonita, I'm just going to temporarily spotlight you so you can give away. Um, but very grateful for her partnership um, in this work and for her belief as well that the pandemic does not slow down the work that we need to do. And this moment, most especially in some ways, I feel highlights the need that we have to come together. And Sydney's poem really spoke to me. I, I had the opportunity to see it earlier. And the word, this is not a black holiday. This, it is a holiday for all of us, but it is not the kind of holiday where we kick back, relax, Maybe we do a little of that, but this is a work holiday. The joyous work of bringing one another together, the joyful hard work of learning to listen and honor and lift up the complexities of who we are as a people and as a community, to honor diversity as the gift that it is, to do the hard work for those of us who are white, leaning in, listening, learning, doing better, ensuring a community that's equitable and just and does not remain silent. And so I'm grateful for this day in the midst of this pandemic when it's easy to sort of let go and say, I've had enough. We can never say we've had enough. It is so deeply important that we push on, push through, lift up and make change. And so on this day, when I'm not in a space with all of you, which I so deeply regret when I am sitting in my, my quiet bedroom, wishing I was surrounded by my community, I remind myself that I am surrounded by community. I'm here with all of you. Tomorrow I will be back at school and with you, I hope that we will continue to do this work, the work that Dr. King lifted up for all of us. He was not just about peace and love. He was about the fight and the struggle and the naming of the injustice and the listening to things that are hard and the owning of wrongs that we have done and of hope and moving forward and following that long arc that bends toward justice. It is we who construct the arc. And it's such a privilege to be in this community working with you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Keisha, our incredible lower school music teacher, who is actually going to teach us uh, about an incredibly moving song and a poem which I think if you listen to what she has to share, you will be struck by how it connects with Sydney's poem and with the words of Rich. Thank you, Andrea. This is an excerpt from the Smithsonian Magazine. Why the Black National Anthem is Lifting Every Voice to Sing by Janelle Harris Dixon. In 1900, James Weldon Johnson composed the poem that would become the hymn that in the 1920s would be adopted by the NAACP as the official Negro national anthem. A prototypical Renaissance man, Johnson was among the first black attorneys to be admitted to the Florida bar. At the same time, he was serving as principal of the segregated Stanton School in Jacksonville, Florida, his alma mater, and the institution where his mother became the city's first black public school teacher. Tasked with saying a few words to kick off the celebration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, Johnson opted to display another one of his many gifts by writing a poem instead of a standard, more easily forgettable speech. He wrestled with perfecting the verses and his equally talented brother, J. Rosamond Johnson, a classically trained composer, suggested setting them to music. 
a chorus of 500 students sang their new hymn at the event. When the two brothers relocated to New York to write Broadway tunes, yet another professional pivot in the Johnson's illustrious career, Lift Every Voice and Sing continued to catch on and resonate in Black communities nationwide, particularly following an endorsement by the influential Booker T. Washington. Millions more have sung it since. Quote, the school children of Jacksonville keep singing it. They went off to other schools and sang it. They became teachers and taught it to other children. Within 20 years, it was being sung over the South and in some other parts of the country, Johnson wrote in 1935. After writing the Black National Anthem, Johnson was appointed United States Counsel first to Venezuela then Nicaragua by the Roosevelt administration. He went on to serve as field secretary for the NAACP, opening branches and enlisting members until he was promoted to chief operating officer, a position that allowed him to outline and implement foundational strategies that incrementally combated racism, lynching and segregation and contributed to the eventual death of Jim Crow laws. The prestige of Lift Every Voice and Sing has become part of its legacy, not just for its distinguished lyrics, but for the way it makes people feel. It inspired legendary artist Augusta Savage to create her 16-foot sculpture, Lift Every Voice and Sing, The Harp, for the 1939 New York World's Fair. Black servicemen on the front lines of World War II sang it together, as have civil rights demonstrators in every decade, most recently on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial following the murder of George Floyd. President Obama joined the chorus of celebrity guests performing it at a White House civil rights concert. Beyonce included it in her stunning Coachella performance in 2018, introducing it to a global audience who may not have known it before. It's been recorded by Weston, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder, and across all genres, jazz, classical, gospel, opera, and R&B. Dr. Timothy Askew, professor of English and Humanities at Clark Atlanta University, who has had an academic love affair with the hymn for nearly 40 years says, quote, a black national anthem is amazing. It is, but the song is an anthem of universal uplift. It's a song that speaks to every group that struggles. When we think of the words, lift every voice, of course, as a black person, I see the struggles of black people. But I also see the struggles of Native Americans. I see the struggles of Chinese Americans. I see the struggles of women. I see the struggles of gays and lesbians. I see the struggles of Jews. I see the struggles of the human condition. And I have to talk about that, end quote. Equal parts honoring the painful past and articulating optimism for the future, the hymn may be Johnson's most well-known contribution because its lyrics remain relevant to where we are as a country in any era, says Dwandalyn Reese, curator of music and performing arts at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Quote, Johnson speaks to a larger trajectory that really shapes us all. The struggle we're seeing today is not just between black and white, it's for all people. We need everyone to stand up and speak out and get engaged in really changing society.
Thank you, friends. I hope that you enjoyed um, the work of Justin Solanika and um, our upper school ensemble um, and the words of Lift Every Voice and Sing. I'm grateful. Thank you, Keisha, for sharing the history of both its illustrious uh, composers and also um, the words of the song and what they mean today for each and every one of us. Um, MLK Day was originally celebrated at Abington Friends School as a, um, as a day of service, and rightfully so in many ways, uh, in honor of the service that Dr. King gave to our country. Um, but in the past few years, with the help of Mikhail Yisrael and others, um, we have really worked to also have it be a day that educates and teaches folks how to move forward and how to engage in the work. Um, and today we are so fortunate um, because we are going to continue our learning. We're grateful to welcome Rebecca Fisher, an AFS alum and the creator of Beyond the Bell Tours. And Beyond the Bell Tours is a social enterprise that's committed to putting the people back into people's history. Rebecca's uh, company, has created an inclusive historical walking tour. She does inclusive historical walking tours of Philadelphia, highlighting marginalized communities, peoples, and histories. And we are grateful that she is here today to tell us some of the stories and histories, to connect with us about um, people that in some ways are near and dear to many of us, and to reteach us some of the things that we thought we knew. And so I'm very grateful to Rebecca, and we will turn the remainder of the program over to her. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, as Andrea said, I am um, an alum class of 2013. But more importantly, I am also substitute teaching in the middle school. Um, so you can find me harassing seventh graders. Uh, uh, and I'm very excited to share some history with you today. Um, I've named this presentation Walking the Light Social Justice and Complicated Quaker History. Um, I also see this presentation as complicating Quaker history, right? I think sometimes we can have a very simplistic uh, narrative about the arc of justice and Quaker history and the roles Quakers have played, which as we know, since racial justice and race are complicated in America, these are complicated throughout history. Um, so uh, it's been mentioned by the founder of Beyond the Bell Tours, we um, highlight women, people of color, queer folks and indigenous people on walking tours in Philadelphia, which is not traditional typically. Um, lots of walking tours in Philly, you might only get a Benjamin Franklin, William Penn, uh, George Washington history. Um, and I'm on the path of trying to alter that. Um, and our cornerstone tours are the Badass Women's History Tour and the Gaberhood Tour. Um, and I'm gonna start us today in a place that I think Quakers really love to start, which is with a tree. Um, I wanted to share the, a little bit of the Pennsylvania origin story with you and Quakers relationship to the Lenny Lenape. Um, which are, of course, the indigenous group that um, occupied this land for countless generations very happily pr prior to the Quakers' arrival in the late 1600s. Um, but this tree has become to symbolize many things. It's seen as a, as a witness, as um, an example um, of peaceful times. And um, it starts really with William Penn. Um, in, uh, in North America, it's hard to find a city that identifies more strongly with its founder than Philadelphia with William Penn. We name schools after him, insurance after him. He stands above us atop City Hall as the largest bronze statue atop a building in the world, right? Like, we love this guy. Um, we don't know, but who is he, right? Um, he was born to a Navy admiral, and his father lends money to the King of England during wartime. And when he dies, William Penn inherits this debt from the King of England. Now it's a wonderful thing to be owed money by the King of England. And he's given Pennsylvania Latin for Penn's Woods and he comes here to create Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. 
And um, when William Penn arrives in, in 1682, he arrives as a Quaker person who believes in equality. And he um, sends people ahead of time to learn the local Lenape language. And um, he meets with Chief Tamament, um, who's the chief at the time of the Lenape. They have an agreement about how much land the British can occupy. He pays Chief Tamament fair market value for um, the land. And um, Chief Tamman divides the goods up amongst his people. And the story goes that um, Penn proclaims, we meet on the broad pathway of good faith and goodwill. No advantage shall be taken on either side, but all shall be openness and love. We are the same as if one man's body was to be divided into two parts. We are one flesh and one blood. To which Chief Tamman replied, we will live in love with William Penn and his children as long as the creeks and rivers run and the sun, moon, and stars endure. Right, very beautiful. Um, and for the most part during William Penn's life, you know, with a few exceptions, this is true. Indigenous people refer to him as Brother Onus. You might hear that echoing from Camp Onus. Um, and they overall regard him well. This legacy, however, is not honored by his sons. Um, and Thomas and William, um, living in the legacy of their father, they decide in order to make a name for themselves, they're gonna extend the perimeter of Pennsylvania, right? This is how they're gonna become known. And so they um, present a document called the Walking Purchase of 1737. And they claim that it's an, it's an unsigned document. They present it to the Lenape. They misrepresent the map of Pennsylvania. Um, they say this doesn't change very much. The Lenape sign it. Um, the sons pre-clear three paths, have three of the fastest runners run for a day and a half, um, and seize as much land as Rhode Island in one day, um, and push the Lenape out of the Delaware Valley. Um, this becomes known as the Walking Purchase of 1737. Today, you can find most of the Lenape in Oklahoma and some smaller communities in Wisconsin and Ontario. Now, even at the time, the Quakers in the colony are unhappy with what's happened. And um, they say, you know, why did you do this to the sons? Their Quakers do not carry weapons. They're vulnerable to retaliation. Um, so what do you do in 1737 when you want to control a narrative? What's a PR campaign in 1737, pre-Instagram, pre-TikTok? Um, it is a painting, right? You commission a painting, an epic painting. Um, and that's what the sons do. They commission this Benjamin West painting. Um, Benjamin West had been the royal painter, very famous in Europe and in the colonies. And they draw attention to that original meeting between William Penn and Chief Tamman. So you can see that image here. This today hangs at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. It's epic, it's enormous if you go. It's this huge painting if you ever get a chance to see it. Um, and it shows William Penn and Chief Tamman the original meeting and the passing of the goods to Chief Tamament. You might notice that this is a really, like a truly peaceful image, right? There are women and babies and everyone's in a relaxed stance and nobody's carrying a weapon. Um, and, you know, even at the most peaceful treaty signing on earth, there aren't necessarily babies, right? This is kind of this very compelling image of peace. Um, and, because this is painted by a famous painter, it gets replicated in art schools all over the world. And um, it's a time where wood etchings are very popular as well. So it reaches a mass media level of audience um, in the 1700s. And people are obsessed with this image and they are also obsessed with the tree, right? The tree in the corner that you see is an American elm and it becomes known as the Penn Treaty Elm. And, um, uh, it gets guarded during, and oh, it's worth, I meant to say, it's also, um, there's no documentation on the colonial side of this event. There's only documentation on the Lenape side. So this is a wampum belt and it depicts William Penn and Chief Tamman holding hands. Um, so because there's no record on the colonial side, people see the tree as this witness to this event. Um, and it gets guarded during the American Revolution. It's in what is today Fishtown. Um, so during the British occupation, the British guard this tree. That is how renowned it is. The British, they're occupying Philadelphia. They know where this tree is. They're guarding it to make sure it's not cut down for lumber. And um, 
1810, it gets struck by lightning and it falls to the ground. And this gets covered in national press. So if you can imagine opening up the um, New York Times today and you hear about a tree that's fallen across the country. So when people read about this tree, they rush to the scene to gather pieces of this American elm to turn it into other things. They turn it into vases and this chair and snuff boxes. Um, and these are all over the world in different um, museums as well as this weird bust of William Penn. And um, they also collect genetic material of the tree. And this, um, they create replicas of the Penn Treaty Elm, um, scions or what they're called, that are, you can find on prominent Quaker sites all over the world and definitely in America, um, and especially in prominent arboretums across the East Coast. And if you walk up to this tree, it'll say to honor William Penn and his commitment to peace, right? Rarely will it say to honor William Penn and Chief Tamman's commitment to peace. Um, rarely will it also say um, what happened in 1737 with the walking pur purchase. What happens when we don't practice peace as an active value, right? What happened there? Um, and I wanted to mention that there are, um, that the, the mo much of this history is monumentalized at Penn Treaty Park, which is Fishtown today. Um, and in 1787, the park decided that they wanted to add a piece of indigenous art to the park. And they end up choosing this piece by Bob Hazos and Fishtown residents hate the piece because it doesn't represent, you know, like an Indian, like a traditional, person that they expect and um, they dislike it so much that this piece is relegated to the street. Instead of being in the actual park, it was designed to be seen from land and sea from the Delaware River um, and inside the park. Um, it's moved into the center of the street and um, it's very easy to miss. That being said, something that I really love about this piece and about Bob Hazos um, is that he always is talking about how he doesn't create um, interior design for white people. He's all, he creates these very unexpected pieces, metalwork, very industrial, huge. Um, this piece depicts that original image of Chief Tamman and William Penn holding hands. Um, and it says underneath, you can't see it from this image, but it says you are on native land. And um, so this piece is in Philadelphia today and it's a very, um, very cool piece of art. Um, and in 2013, Dwayne Linklater added um, this piece to the Penn Treaty Park, um, and it says the words of Chief Tamman, as long as creeks and rivers run and the stars and moon um, endure. And it, it's written in the handwriting of his nine-year-old daughter, no longer nine years old, but nine years old at the time, to represent how um, indigenous knowledge passes between generations. And I think the thing that I really like about both these pieces is that they're um, very much contemporary indigenous art. Um, Stephanie Match, who's an indigenous scholar, um, writes that what she loves about them is that neither of them are figural representation. They're not people, but they represent people in history. They rep represent indigenous past, present, and future. And they don't do that through the standard monument of the colonizer. So that is the legend of the Penn Treaty Elm. Um, we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, to talk about um, abolition. And if you do have questions, you can type it into the chat and I'll look at it at the end. Um, but I feel like abolition is a really great example of a really simplistic Quaker history that we get, which is that the Quakers are central to the realization of abolition and to ending slavery, which is true. But again, um, I think that we, we have to complicate that history because there's it, it is complicated. And I think by letting history be complicated, we get closer to the truth and truth is the only path forward. So um, abolition um, starts in 68, 1688. Um, Quakers, it's the first time Quakers speak out against slavery. It's also the first time that any religious group in the colonies speak out against slavery. And they do it on Germantown Ave, so two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. Um, the Quakers produced the 1688 Germantown petition against slavery. And the first time that they read it out loud is at the Abington meeting house, Abington Friends meeting house. You have um, very early Quakers like Benjamin Lay, who's one of the earliest and fiercest opponents to slavery, um, challenging his, his fellow Quakers on their stance um, 
in their stance of slavery. He refuses to wear or eat any product that is connected to slave later, labor. And he's also buried in the Abington Friends um, Cemetery. And there's a plaque for him there as well. And you should definitely read more about him. Um, the first legislation against slavery in the country is written by um, Judge William Lewis. Um, and he creates something called the Gradual Abolition Act of 1780. Um, the way that this works is that every Pennsylvania resident had to free their slaves after six months of residency. Now, people like George Washington, who are living in Philadelphia, are getting around this by cycling, um, cycling his slaves, the nine people who are enslaved, who are living at the president's house with him. Um, this, is an, this is the president's house, which is right by the Liberty Bell, um, where many of us go to celebrate American liberty. Um, George Washington lived there with nine enslaved peoples. And he cycles um, these people between Mount Vernon, Virginia and Philadelphia every five months and 29 days in order to avoid this legislation. Um, the next thing that um, I was thinking about um, and that I wanna talk about today is um, Quakers are, were also um, central to the founding of many of the educational institutions in Philadelphia, including um, places like the Institute for Colored Youth, right? Black educational institutions. Um, the Institute for Colored Youth was the first Black high school in America. Um, but one of the things that um, is important to think about is that the Quakers, by founding these Black educational institutions, used these institutions to justify the exclusion of Black Philadelphians from Quaker schools like Abington Friends. Um, so most Quaker schools in Philadelphia do not integrate until the 1900s and really mid 1900s. And I'm gonna read the words of Samuel Ringgold Ward, who was a former enslaved man who becomes a minister in 1855. And he says this about the Quakers. They give us good advice. They will aid in giving us partial education, but never in Quaker schools besides their own children. What they do for us savors of pity and is done at arm's length. So that is something I'm thinking about today. Um, the other thing um, to think about is meeting houses were segregated. Um, Arch Street Meeting House had a back row that was for Black Quakers. Um, and people like Sarah Maps Douglas spoke out early and often against the discrimination within the actual physical meeting houses. Um, she was a Black educator, Sarah Maps Douglas, um, famous Black educator. Um, very much part of Philadelphia's Black elite. Um, she was well known for her art that I have on here. This art is considered to be um, some of the earliest examples of um, signed art by a Black woman in America. Um, she was a renowned teacher both in New York and Philadelphia. Um, and she was actually the head of the primary school at the Institute of Colored Youth. Um, she also attended Women's Med, which is another Quaker founded institution. Um, this was the only degree granting medical school for women to receive medical degrees in the world. Um, and when Sarah Maps Douglas attends, she becomes um, the first black woman to study medicine. And it's originally on Six and Arch where there's a plaque there today. It's the Federal Reserve today. Um, but a fervent abolitionist, um, she and other women realized that they were being locked out of the abolitionist movement. So the abolitionist movement um, it started in Philadelphia and you know, Quakers, they love our committees and our groups. Um, but women are not allowed to attend these meetings or be part of these groups. So um, women like Sarah Maps Douglas and Lucretia Mott um, create the Female Anti-Slavery Society, um, which was integrated from its inception. Um, the white women who were part of the group were predominantly Quaker. Um, so women like Angelina and Sarah Grinke, um, they are, um, one second. They um, come from South Carolina to join the abolitionist movement. Um, they grow up on a plantation and moved by what they see of the horrors, the reality of the horrors of slavery. They decide to leave the plantation and join um, the abolitionist movement in Philadelphia. Um, Sarah Grimke um, joins Sarah Mapp Douglas on that back, um, back row in Arch Street Meeting House in order to protest. Um, what she sees and what Sarah Maps Douglas talks about is the discrimination against Black Quakers. Um, now, um, when 
the female anti-slavery society uh, is created. This is really the moment that women enter into politics in America. There's no women's rights movement without this moment, without the female anti-slavery society. So the women, um, when they start to want, want to meet, they have this issue, they have this problem that no one will let them meet anywhere. No one will allow them to rent a room or um, have their discussions freely in any physical space in Philadelphia. So they decide what they're gonna do is they're gonna raise money um, to create their own space. They're gonna build a place called Pennsylvania Hall. So the women walk around all Philadelphia and they knock on doors and they ask women in the home to sign a petition. This is the first time this is ever done where women are asked to sign a petition to participate in politics. Um, and they successfully raise money and they finish Pennsylvania Hall and the Female Anti-Slavery Society decides that they're gonna hold a convention, an anti-slavery convention of American women. And this is 1838. And um, they are going to meet in this space and there's grumblings kind of growing in the city about this meeting, that there are going to be women who are going to be talking about politics and that also white and black women are going to be sitting together. So um, the mayor actually orders them to restrict access only to white women. He says, this is going to cause too many issues, at least only have white women speaking out. And the women refuse and they meet in this space. Additionally, Angelina Grunke gets married the night before the beginning of the, um, the beginning of the convention and the attendees, uh, including Sarah Maps Douglas, um, are interracial. So she, um, so this creates more tension in the city. Um, and people were upset that women were giving speeches, people were upset that they were talking about controversial issues such as slavery um, and a angry mob forms outside of Pennsylvania Hall on the third day of the convention during Angelina Grunke's Weld speech, right? So she's like the keynote speaker, speaker of this convention and she's speaking out and she starts to hear rocks being thrown in um, and the windows are starting to shatter and she finishes, she continues with her speech in this kind of like amazing, almost Hollywood level of moment. Um, and as it's escalating outside, um, everybody leaves the hall when they realize that the mob has lit fire to Pennsylvania Hall. Um, so everybody gets out safely, but um, Pennsylvania Hall three days after it's built is burned to the ground. Um, and the fire department stands there and puts out fire on either side of Pennsylvania Hall, thus letting Pennsylvania Hall burn down. Um, None of these women are discouraged though. You can find Angelina and Sarah on the forefront of the abolitionist and women's rights movement, um, as well as Lucretia Mott, as well as Sarah Maps Douglas, um, who devotes much of her life to um, black education. Um, and so these are a few stories. I'm gonna check the chat to see if there's any. Um, oh, somebody asked about a picture of Sarah Maps Douglas. So there actually is not a surviving image of Sarah Maps Douglas. And often when somebody uses a picture of Sarah Maps Douglas, that's not her, that's another black woman. Um, so that's why I have chosen not to include an image of Sarah Maps Douglas, um, cause I could not find one that was definitively um, proven to be hers. Um, I appreciate everybody and their time um, today. And I hope that um, today is a time of reflection on the work that we continue to have to do. Um, I am curious if anybody has any questions before I close myself out. Books about Sarah Maps Douglas. Um, I don't know. I'd have to do a little bit more research for that. But um, I found some interesting Quaker. The, um, FCS, right? The Friends, yeah, FCS has some um, good writing on her. Um, the Institute of Colored Youth was located on 9th and Bainbridge and today is um, located outside of the city. It's um, now in, I think, a, a black college at HBC. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think um, Rebecca needs a Zoom clap. This is in case those of you don't know, this is a Zoom clap. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was really, um, we will be sending out um, a thank you 
And on our website, we will post information about Beyond the Bell tours. And also um, there was a question earlier about the, the article that Keisha read from. We will post the link so that you can read that article in its entirety. Um, but I think Rebecca reminds us to dig deeper and to look, look beyond what's presented to us as fact. Um, so thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you to everyone today for, um, thank you to everyone for being here, uh, for being part of this, this beautiful morning. We urge you to go out into the world and do the work in big ways and in small ways. All the ways are what is required in order for us to go about building a just and equitable society. And we urge you um, to engage, to work toward justice, to lean in and to embrace. And many thanks to all the friends for being here today. Have a very beautiful day. Thank you, Andrea. We have this entire misunderstanding. Thank you, friends. You can unmute to say thank you, to say goodbye to. It. It's what we do with the kids, actually. When we Bye. close meeting for worship, we all unmute. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. Guys. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Go well and be well.